How's everyone doing? So um, I have to say, it is so refreshing to walk into a place where people want to make change. I mean, I don't think you guys realize the uniqueness you have right now by having all these advocates here. In, in our school, we don't call folks champions of change. We call folks like you lifeguards. Because for us, the premise is, is that you're there to facilitate, not to do for kids, but to facilitate. And you're there to constantly watch, just like a lifeguard. Take that stand, make sure you're there to support, but not to do. And so a lot of the questions I heard um, are around this idea of our expanded day program that talks about how do we get kids to do, right? Not that teachers, you guys do all the work, how do we get kids to do all the work? And so by having that opportunity of extra time, and that's what this is, this is an opportunity to get quality extra time. So for a school like mine, I don't see this as, again, and I told you guys yesterday, I did warn you about giving me the mic too, right? I don't see this necessarily as um, an additional time to the day. I see it as a bi-directional influence. So for us, our after-school folks actually impact our school day. So I'll give you an example. So we have a cadre of young folks who have sort of a gap year, right? Just finished college, sort of trying to figure out what they want to do, want to get some experience. So what we have them do is work with an organization that's job is to bring that extra labor force to assist classroom teachers. Because classroom teachers have it hard. I mean, I don't know if some of you have been in those classrooms, but they have a, an incredible responsibility. The reality is, though, that our kids are who the ones who are under enormous pressure to succeed in a system where there's less and less individual time. So the issue for us was this issue of labor. We had class sizes of 30 to 40, maybe going 40 to 50 on the high school level. And we're trying to figure out how to get these additional resources into the classroom. So we had this group of young folks who wanted to get involved. And we gave them about three weeks of training over the summer. And they go into the classroom now, right? So they work after school. And they're going into the classroom and becoming teaching assistants. So now a teacher has three or four different folks to help them assess issues in the classroom. As a school, we also don't, uh, we, we frown upon doing homework. We rather use that extended time to embed homework in the activities of after school, which is again, that bi-directional influence. That's the school day influencing what happens after school. And I have to tell you, you do have to be able to have those conversations between the school day folks and the after school. That's the hardest part. Yesterday I talked about having a clear purpose, right? W what is the goal? It's not a school goal and an after school goal. What is our goal? We are the lifeguards here. How are we gonna support our young people? And so for us, it's all about figuring out whether it's gonna impact the school day or the after school program what are we going to do to leverage that goal, that experience gap that we talk about? How are we going to make sure our kids can compete, right? So we take, for, uh, we take advantage of the fact that our kids are trained, particularly middle class kids, upper middle class kids, to expect things, right? We expect that the teacher answers our question. When you go to a private school, we expect that our classroom ratios are small. I think it's a really about the principal, the leader, the, the after school uh, executive director dreaming first. Then we go find the resources. So one of the things I'm gonna do later on with my brothers up here is this idea called community asset mapping, right? So everywhere I go, number one thing people talk about is, sounds great, sounds great, Mr. Gonzalez. I love the idea of having all these great things, but we can't afford them. We don't have the resources, we don't have the money. And so this idea of community mapping came about, and this came out of Harvard University, the first time I, I went to a workshop, is everyone in the neighborhood is an asset. And we don't think that way. We think some neighborhoods are not as much assets as other neighborhoods. This is a reframing. I see, see, I tell you, I love this audience. Thank you. So this is a reframing. So let me see if we can get up the, so, we have uh, uh, this idea of taking something like Google Maps, right? Taking your neighborhood, 
doing, we all can do this, right? We can um, take in a Google map of your neighborhood and then start to think about what are resources, what are assets in the neighborhood that can impact the school, right? That's a different way of looking at things. Too often we're waiting for a government to solve our problems. I'm sorry guys, I don't wait for my government to solve the problems because I'll be waiting for a long time. So what I do is I go out and seize the opportunity, right? I mean, I'm not gonna sit there and watch my kids struggle because of resources. I'm gonna go get the resource, so this is how we do it. I think I got this down right. Am I using the right clicker? Oh, there we go. Nope, that's not the clicker. No, it's all right. All right, so if you notice, in the Bronx, this is uh, the Harlem River that goes to the Bronx. And we have this, uh, thank you, my, the Dutch uh, ancestors here for providing us with the Harlem River. Uh, we have a split in the water, and this split is really the split in our community, right? And I'm talking about community big C in general. Um, we have educators and after school folks on one side. We have parents, community on the other side. And some of us rather keep that separation, right? But it's really about how do we get that, uh, that separation to come together. So this is basically the model we use, right? Three, three different groups of folks. You got your community assets, your individual assets, and your institutional assets. So it's taking a map of your neighborhood and breaking them up into these different assets. And what we do is we help leaders plan from the goal to how to measure that goal to how to sustain that goal. And what we design with this is basically a fundraising approach and how to get funds for whatever project you want. We did a project in the Bronx where we said, look, we have a community that is struggling with literacy, and I heard somebody bring up literacy. This is universal. We're, we're struggling with it in New York City as well. And we said, you know, we have a lot of uh, parents who, we, again, expectations, middle class expectations, who can't read to their children because of language issues, right? They have maybe a second, third grade reading level, and we have kids now in middle school. There is a gap there, right? There's a gap analysis into the neighborhood. Now, mind you, my school is one of 25 schools in the neighborhood. So I could be a principal and just worry about my little building. Or I could say, I want to impact the world. I want to impact the neighborhood. And so what do we do? We decided to make a community reading campaign where folks donated books. We took these book bins. We put them in all the bodegas in the neighborhood, all our community stores. Right? So we have parents, our immigrant parents, who are afraid to come into the school because they were scared. It's a government institution. I might be deported. I'd rather find another way to get support. So we use what we know they would go to. They're gonna go buy milk, they can pick up a book. And so, and what we decided to do is buy books that were on the second, third grade level to have a universal application. We also send home one page readers on a second and third grade level. There are programs out there, doesn't cost you any money. News, News ELA is one of them. I mean, I can name you 10 other uh, programs that you could do it costs you just to print the paper, right? Have that, you can give that out to parents. And then we also have a teacher flip the classroom by taping that and, and putting it online. So now you, if you can't read to your child, you got somebody to read to your child. If you wanna to read to your child but don't have um, high reading level, we have a, uh, we've adapted a reading piece. And you have the materials. Now this is all based on research, right? Because what research says is that People want to help their child, but they don't have the materials. They don't have the resources that are accessible to help their child. So what do we do? We take the resources out of the school and bring them into the neighborhood. Now we have a literacy campaign, right? Now we can affect the whole neighborhood, not just the school. That's using community resources. Because oftentimes we saw, school, uh, we saw these local stores as just places to ask for money. You know, I'm gonna go do the school year book and I'm gonna go by and ask for $50 and hopefully somebody will give us that. And that was just a small idea. That wasn't a big strategic idea. Now we see them as networks of mini libraries where when people go to buy milk, they could pick up a book as well. And now we have spread across the neighborhood. And it was also a great way for us to promote different programs in the school. Our, our ESL program, our computer program for parents, 
using community resources, right? Um, we had a, a, another, let me see if I have it up here. So this is uh, Cornell University. So you, someone talked about experiential um, experiences of kids outside the program. So we do something where every grade, we're six to 12. Every grade from sixth grade to 12th grade does an overnight trip out of college. For us, the game changer is that kids have to spend overnight at a university, right? Now people are like, oh my God, what is that gonna cost, bus? Remember, I said dream first. Let's dream first, right? Then we start worrying about. So we decided to do these overnight trips, and in the United States, we have a, a, a large number of folks uh, in fraternities and sororities. So what did we do? We went to the universities that we want our kids to go to, and we called up their fraternities and sororities. And we said, we know that you have to commit to community service. We know that. We know your charter. We know how it works. We want you now to adopt a school and sponsor that trip. One call. That was $6,000 we got from the fraternity and sorority. But nobody asked them. Nobody went directly to them. Again, using community resources. There's a university. They have assets there. People. How do we leverage those people? I was talking to another gentleman who talked about um, folks who give up six months of their time. I forgot the Schwabco. Is that the, the name of the program? All right, you guys know it. I mean, another program. It's been around for right, 75 years. Another program where are people asking those programs for resources, as opposed to waiting for somebody to give it to you. Right? So this is, I mean, in, in New York City, we're trying to promote, push our principles to be entrepreneurial. Not wait for resources to come to them, but to demand those resources. I mean, even the $2,000, before our partnership, with the expanded day program, we raise the money ourselves. Now mind you, we don't charge fees in the United States. There's no fees. And your parents are not bringing in money because they don't have money. So you better be really good at figuring out the community and how to re raise resources from other folks. And what we do is we try to always think about what is their goal? How do we align, because we have one goal now, right? Between the app school and, and the school day. How do we align our goal with that goal? So what you do with this model, again, is that you start pointing out all the different institutions, community organizations, and individuals, right? So we do something called the January experience. So we decide in January, our kids are so sick of these compartmentalized schedules, right? I know we got a lot of centralized folks here, but it's not the most helpful program for kids. If we're personalizing, individualizing instruction, some periods are gonna be 35 minutes, some periods are gonna be 70 minutes, some periods might be 135 minutes. If I'm doing a science class, oh, please don't tell me you're doing a 35 minute science class. I am scared if that's the instruction. You need to have double periods or triple periods to do lab work, right? So what we do is we say, okay, we wanna do a science program, we don't have microscopes, we wanna make sure our kids get industry standard science experience. So in poor neighborhoods, we have a lot of health institutions in those poor neighborhoods. In the South Bronx, we probably have about 10 to 15 health organizations. So what do we do? We say we go to a health organization and say, look, we're trying to do this real world idea of a science lab. How can you help us, right? And they couldn't give us an answer. So you don't say that. You go in with a plan. And you say, this is how I think you can help us. So we need about 15 tutors from your program. Now remember how folks are like, well, that's all money. That's $2,000 per person. How are we going to get the people? So we went to the, to the help centers and said, we need 15 tutors. We just need you to commit two days a week for six weeks. Now professionals like fixed amount of time. Don't leave it open. They don't want to hear you want to keep them there for the next 10 years. They don't want to hear that. So you give them a fixed amount of time. You give them a fixed amount of hours. Now you have these folks coming into your building, providing, I mean, you're getting help professionals provide tutoring. I mean, that sounds better than a college kid providing tutoring, right? You're getting these folks with real world experiences and you come in and you set up a script for them so they know what to do to come in your, they don't, they don't, don't make it that they have to think about stuff. Keep it real simple so they can come in. And for me, it's not the tutoring that's the big part. It's the role model part that's the big part. 
Getting these folks that your kids can see models of people in the industry. I mean, talk about game changing. You want to talk about game changer? That's a game changer. I'll give you another example. And I'm sorry, but I'm giving you foreshadowing of that workshop later, so make sure you come. Again, dream big, right? Just so you see where I'm going with this, right? Clear purpose, dream big. So we had an issue where we had a school closing in the neighborhood, right? I don't know if you guys go through this, but we go through this in New York. School was failing. You had 300 kids who now, uh, in their middle school years, had to find a new school. And most principals are like, no way, no, I can't. You're gonna kill my school. And I'm not sure people be so welcoming here as well, right? You have the most difficult kids now being um, asked to come into your school in numbers above 70, 80 kids, right? So we already knew this was gonna re require like probably eight or nine guidance counselors. Now, how are you gonna get eight or nine guidance counselors, right? <laughs> Dream big. See where I'm going with this? All right. So we said, okay, we have four universities in within a mile and a mile and a half of this school, right? Which who never come to the school. But I will, I will be honest with you, we probably have never asked them to come to the school. So we go to those universities and we say, look, you guys have a counseling program. Columbia has a counseling program. We will pay for the transportation of folks, which is a metro car. We're not talking breaking the bank here. But we would rather give your guys real world experience. We know guidance counselors have a tough job getting into the school system. We will give you access to the school under our guidance if you provide us with interns, right? Now, a guidance counselor in New York City is $60,000, $70,000. I'm now getting seven or eight guidance counselors every year to work with my kids. And these are young folks who are excited to work with my kids, right? I don't have a 20-year veteran who's like, mm, today, I don't know. No, I have these young folks who are ready to run in there and do whatever they can to save the world. That passion is what I want in my school. Now I design a schedule for them, design a program for them, I now have $350,000 worth of services for my children. Dream big. So, I was supposed to talk five minutes. I tell you, be careful with this mic. It's magic, it's magic mic. All right, so there goes um, the different institutions, even the parks, right? We had the parks department come in to our gym program um, and do um, workouts with our, gym, with our phys ed folks. Um, and then bring them to the park to conclude those workshops. So now you have this outside, inside, the kids know the neighborhood. I mean, the, the dirty secret, and let's just be honest, most of our staff in schools have no idea of the neighborhood, right? We know this. They come into the building, they do their job, go home. This is also a way for your staff, both after school and during the school day, to come together around the school. So an activity we do, to bring the staff together, right, to make it one community, is we do a, you guys seen Amazing Race? You guys seen that show? So we do that same concept with community mapping, where we say, we want you to find these three institutions. We want you to find these three community assets. We want you to find these three individuals who do this. We break the school up into teams of after school and during the school day, and we have them race around the neighborhood. It looks a little weird. People are like, where are all these? Different folks I've never seen before in the neighborhood. I'm running around into the bodega, running around into the help center, the laundromat, and they gotta take a picture of where they were at so we can post those pictures. These are ways that, that we bring the community together. And then of course, you could do the same idea with kids. Can you imagine your kids getting Google Maps of the neighborhood and knowing their neighborhood better and where are the assets in their neighborhood? I mean, that's a very powerful child now in your neighborhood who knows where to get help. Remember I said that middle class child who knows how to self-advocate? I want our poor kids to know how to self-advocate, which is why we do this type of activity. And then I'm gonna, call, I'm gonna put a stop to that. Brother, let's get the audience, come on. Wow, how many of you are inspired? I mean, that's... will literally take two questions. Two questions, there's one there. Uh, no, I, I'm gonna have to give somebody else a chance to answer. Uh, you, you've been kind and generous with your questions. But. <laughs> Thank you. Ahmed Solomon, Scout South Africa. 
I'm in awe of, of your presentation and the inspiration and the ideas that you share. Thank you. And I see you as a visionary. My question to you is, well, one question, who manages your school? <laughs> um, while you're thinking about that, um, two words, growth and succession. The Western Cape is quite small in its infancy in terms of the after school game changer program. Service providers are also quite young. What advice would you give to the Western Cape Education Department as well as service providers in terms of the pitfalls when they are growing and also in terms of succession? Those are great questions. Those are and probably the, the best questions you can ask about uh, sustaining programs. I think sometimes folks like me get so passionate that we forget that we gotta get other people to step up as well. And so one of the things we do, I'm, I'm a big leader developer. I'm a person who believes fundamentally that the best principal is one that doesn't have to be at their school. Because if you are challenging people, you are providing development, you are really focused on developing the next group of leaders, then you should be able to step away from the building. So this whole week, I have school going on in my building. It's not like it just closed. School is going on, but I have my leaders who I've been developing over years. Because if I want the school to succeed without me, then I have to develop those leaders. And I think that's the problem with some of our leadership is that we become so, you know, want to control the whole situation that we miss the forest, which is that school's supposed to exist without us. Same with after school developers. If you're really good, then kids, should, you should get kids to the point where they self-advocate where they don't need you. That's the whole goal of this, right? <clears throat> so it is, um, I do two retreats a year with my staff, pull my staff out the building, something like this, get them to reflect, get somebody out there who really wants to help to sponsor it. Um, doesn't cost the government anything. It's all going out there. Um, and we use that time to do three or four different strategies to help those leaders. I mean, another piece is that also that balance, right? Teaching leaders how to handle the stress of the job. That's another component we teach. And then ultimately, you gotta give people opportunities to experience leadership. So if I want somebody to be a principal, assistant principal, whatever type of role, I'm gonna give them opportunities to, so I have my, one of my teacher leads the expanded day program. Mr. Martinez, incredible, incredible. Um, huge service learning guy. Came out of the youth development world, convinced them to go to teaching, and now he runs uh, the after school program. And he's, you're talking about 25 staff members that he oversees, probably 80% of teachers. That is a great opportunity to develop leadership, right? It's giving folks the opportunity and support in those leadership roles, and then not just delegating. A mistake leaders make is we'll say, okay, you do it. I seen you do it, you do it, and walk away. And forget that, I need to check in with you, we need time to talk about your experience, let's talk about other strategies, how do you uh, manage staff, how are you supporting your staff, who you're cheerleading, that's work. But the institution lives beyond you. Now if your ego is so big that you must control everything, then I don't know if you're really being that lifeguard for children. You may think you are, but I don't, I don't that institution has to live beyond you. It should not end with you. And I think that's a mistake a lot of our principals make, is that we get so caught up in the job that we forget that the job should exist without us. All right, and I know he hasn't even started yeah, answering I, I, the second question, but I think that's actually a wonderful point to end it on. Romo, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. For you.